of Bif. So, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another edition of our fireside chats. Uh, so, today we are going to look at one topic which is, I think, on everyone's mind. So, the Ukraine Russia conflict, but we are taking a, a multilateral view. We're looking at the role of United Nations in this conflict. And to discuss this, we have Chirayu Thakkar today. So, before I give it to Shreyas Deshmukh, who's the moderator, just a brief about Asian Pathfinders. Uh, we started in March, uh, sorry, May 2020, and uh, we've been holding online sessions on uh, different aspects from geopolitics, security, climate change, uh, women empowerment, everything. So uh, we always welcome suggestions and inputs from the community uh, for these sessions. So how to get in touch with us, uh, basically. Oh, yeah. So you can write to us on these IDs and we'll be happy to take suggestions and inputs from the community. And we have a few exciting sessions upcoming. So you can always follow us on our social media pages and stay in touch. So, and about today's uh, session, uh, we have uh, Shreyas Deshmukh as the moderator and Chirayu Thakkar as the speaker. So I'll introduce Shreyas. Uh, Shreyas is obviously, a lot of you know, is the co-founder of Asian Pathfinders along uh, with me. And uh, Shreyas also works as a research associate at Delhi Policy Group, a premier think tank in, uh, De based in Delhi, India. And he's also worked as a geopolitical risk analyst at Pitcad Advisory Services. And he's also worked uh, with IDSA as well as Center for Land Warfare Studies. And Shreyas's area of interest include uh, regional security developments uh, in the AF Park region and around uh, Central Asia. <coughs> Over to you, Shreyas. I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pallavi. And uh, I hope you can hear me. And thank you so much, Chirai, for joining us today. Uh, uh, so we have today my friend, good friend, uh, Mr. Chirai Thakkar, to speak on the role of UN in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, Chirayu is a doctoral candidate uh, jointly with uh, National University of Singapore and King's College London. Uh, earlier, he earned uh, graduate degrees in modern South Asian studies from the University of Oxford and in political science from the Central European University. Uh, he researches on Indian foreign policy, Indo-Pacific security, and multilateralism. So today he's going to speak about the multilateralism and uh, how UN is playing the role in, as I said, uh, ongoing conflict uh, in Europe. So there are two parts of this uh, the, today's discussion. Obviously, first is the role of UN in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And the second is, as uh, Chirav has written a very interesting piece for the South Asian Voices he, where he has discussed the role of India also in this conflict, the way India voted in uh, UN uh, Security Council. So, <clears throat> going through his article, uh, interestingly, he has written uh, where he said the FOID reached to the doors of UNSC, the ongoing FOID. He said the responsibility for the maintaining peace and stability, uh, peace and security globally is lies with the UNSC. So this is the main question. Is it so? And how it is and how the UNSC and the UN related agencies are playing role in this conflict. So first I'll hand it over to uh, Chirayu for his opening remarks and further we will have a discussion as we go along with this session. Chirayu, over to you. Uh, thank you, Shreyas and Pallavi, for uh, hosting me. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, I'm not usually a, a prop guy. So even when I teach at the uni, I don't use so many slides or visual uh, elements. Uh, so I'll uh, spare you from that. Uh, now, when Shreyas was uh, planning this event, he was also willing to invite someone who has worked earlier with the MEA. And he said, sir, would you like to join this event? And the person said, look, UN has no role to play in this situation. Uh, essentially saying that uh, UN is a debating society and therefore I'm not interested. So if you are willing to plan something on the crisis per se, he was willing to speak, but 
he wasn't very interested in speaking on the role of the United Nations. And I think that is uh, a very prevalent, predominant view uh, that United States, uh, United Nations is a sort of a toothless body. And uh, uh, it has no role to play whatsoever in such conflicts. I think uh, United Nations inability to prevent a lot of crises that we have seen over the years, or at least uh, in the 70 years of its existence, uh, prompts us to think uh, that uh, uh, United Nations is good for nothing. But I think that you need to be qualified. And uh, whatever little role it plays, why it plays, and if it is not able to play the role, why it is not able to play the role? So, so that is uh, one of the uh, one of the starting points. But as Indians, most of us, uh, we are interested in the role of India. So, the first and obvious part, uh, I'll briefly answer in five to seven minutes, and then I'll go to the role of India and where India stands and, and uh, 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 how India decides, how India uh, uh, forms its opinions and how India votes. So, uh, UN's role, particularly, again, when I say UN's role, uh, we can discuss about a specific agency of the United Nations. So yesterday I and Shreyas, we were talking about something and uh, he was interested uh, uh, and we were chatting about IAEA. Now, this could be a separate debate altogether. Uh, how effective is IAEA in securing nuclear facilities? Uh, you know, so, that, so that could be a specific UN agency, which is a specialized one. Another uh, could be UN uh, uh, agency for refugees. Uh, how is it doing? So when we say of UN, United Nations uh, uh, has a lot of specialized agency and each agency has a role to play. Currently, if you look in Afghanistan, the World Food Program is doing a phenomenal job uh, because uh, uh, 23 out of 38 million people are under uh, a grinding shortage of food. Uh, they did a telephonic survey and I think uh, the results were very staggering, or disappointing uh, that 98% uh, of the people, those who they, uh, the, the UN agencies called, and this is based on the directory. So these are these people, those who have survived uh, uh, the fall of Kabul, uh, they are still able to remain in their homes and they have working telephones, which is in itself a luxury. Uh, if you talk about uh, 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 what, what Kabul and Afghanistan went through. Now, even in those people, they find that 98 out of 100 people uh, do not have enough food to eat. So these people, they survived the trauma, they survived the assault on Kabul, they survived the civil war, they still have big mansions that can have uh, a working telephone, but they don't have enough food on their plate, uh, which, is a, uh, 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 which is a catastrophe uh, given the size of uh, Afghanistan. Now, currently, if you want to talk about Afghanistan, the current leading agency there uh, uh, working to solve this problem is the World Food Program. So when we again say the role of United Nations, we can talk about individual UN agency and the role they play in mitigating the plight of people. So even if, uh, let's say, uh, United Nations Security Council or United Nations General Assembly is not able to prevent uh, uh, a conflict from happening, uh, this UN agencies, they serve as a key focal point for actors, those who want to alleviate human suffering, uh, 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 be it uh, donors, be it multilateral agencies, be it private players. How do you make sure that the aid reaches to the last mile? How do you make sure that the nuclear reactors uh, don't start emitting gamma radiation that screws people who are already in, in a miserable situation due to war? So, each agency and, and their work can be looked into in detail, but again, this is not a semester long program, so I'm not going to venture into it. We'll keep it uh, short to UN Security Council. 
now un security council uh, as uh, i think uh, rather snarkly uh, uh, shreyas addressed uh, was that is uh, 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 and i could see from his giggle that uh, he was not very happy with the reference that it's, uh, it it is responsible for the maintenance of peace and security globally but that is what the un charter mandates is now there are two types of situations uh, conflict situations that can be broadly divided so the first situation is where uh, a superpower is not involved and and the uh, second situation is where a superpower is involved now the situations where superpower is not involved are a lot of conflicts uh, perhaps going on in the horn of africa uh, or, or once they were going on in east timor in southeast asia or they were going they are going on in myanmar these are the sort of conflicts where they become a playground uh, for great power politics uh, proxy wars sometimes but a great power is not directly involved so that is the first kind of situation now there is a second kind of situation where a great power has a lot of stakes uh, which is what happened in iraq which is uh, currently going on in in ukraine now these are the two types of conflicts now in the first type of conflict even though if united nations uh, uh, is not very successful in preventing all of them but we have seen that from time to time on moral grounds on humanitarian grounds on many other grounds uh the the key actors in un security council they are willing uh, to come together and work together uh, of course there are uh, cases where uh, there is no interest for example the rwandan genocide the genocide happened uh, under the watch of un but when 800000 people were getting killed uh the mission the un mission there it was not replenished what 2500 un peacekeepers can do uh, uh to resolve this and it remains a blot it remains uh, a glaring failure on the part of united nations that resources were uh, uh, uh not supplied so again when we say uh, that united nations security council wants uh, to prevent a situation first there has to be a political will uh, which sometimes is a blend of political will and security interests as well because perhaps something that is happening in the uh, in the horn of africa you don't want to spill over or refugee uh, uh, impact uh, in in europe and that's why you try to prevent it uh, also there is a moral ground to it so it's a blend of ideas and interests it is, it is uh, the, the variables are not independent there is always a blend of ideas and interests that is working together uh but in rwanda perhaps that at that point uh, ideas and interests were not there and even when a active un mission was there what happened was that you are unwilling to commit resources now why the united nations why europe why uh, so russia they were unable to commit resources it's a different story uh, and, and what uh, what were the motivations of each actors uh, uh, that that is again a, a matter of a specific case study but but it remains that if there is not sufficient motivation for actors to commit resources then what we can see is that despite there is a political agreement that something should be done something is not done so first layer comes the agreement between key players the second is whether this uh, people are willing to commit resources and uh, uh, things can happen with security council things can happen without security council now if you look at the new labor party uh, the new labor as they call it not the new labor party the labor party was the same but uh, with around uh, like mid and late 90s in britain it was called the new labor they had a very a different economic view they had uh, also this called third way economic policy which then had a new and defining third way a foreign policy in in in, in british history and uh, tony blair uh, uh, was the key uh, protagonist uh, uh, in that doctrine and they went on their own in sierra leone 
there was of course the united nations mission and this chap they go there initially uh, for the safe evacuation of uh, uh, british and foreign troops uh, sorry british and foreign citizens um, and when i say foreign citizens what i mean is uh, particularly western citizens because that that is what they are most uh, <clears throat> concerned about uh, but then they expanded their mission and then uh, uh, they stayed there they fought R RUF under certain conditions so they were willing to do more uh, now again it depends on what is the discourse that is going on in domestic country there was also a situation where belgium had committed troops but 10 of their people they were i think killed or taken hostages and belgium decided that oh no this is a tragedy we can't uh, uh, you know uh, kill our troops or kill our citizens very innocent one just for the sake of stability and security in some african country and therefore we are pulling back our troops so uh, a third issue is how is the discourse playing out in domestic country whether you have an activist tony blair he says that oh we need to go uh, to the world and, and uh, ensure safety and security and we have to uh, ensure humanitarian ground so on and so forth uh, or there can be a more reservist belgium who says that oh if our people are dying needlessly we don't need to ensure safety and security in africa so a whether political convergence is there among key actors b whether they are willing to commit resources and c uh, what is the discourse going on this three elements of the key united nations security uh, council members and when i say key security council members i mean five the rest of 10 most of it is for domestic audiences and, and um, you know unless you are serious let's say india is a serious player australia is a serious player if, if they're on the council they want to make a mark for others uh, they, they are not very committed uh, 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 it's it's just a ride for them uh, to go, to burnish their uh, domestic credentials. So uh, and and most of them, if you look at the memoirs of people those who have served uh, in the United Nations, if you look at their memoirs, most of them they are willing to vote either side for some favors. So it's a used bargaining cheap for them. Uh, a country, a very small country with no stakes in a region, uh, let's say a small uh, Pacific Island countries, it is it, it gets elected because there's a geographic distribution of seats, you get chance once in a while, you are there on the council. <coughs> Sorry. You are there on the council and you have no stakes in Africa. You have made no stakes is what is going in Iraq. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This is none of our business. We'll vote whatever way you want to vote us. So in that situation, uh, they would like, okay, we are voting with you. What are we getting in return? So that is how the game is played. So this is the first type of situation where great power politics is not involved. And there is a high likelihood uh, that political convergence will happen. But again, once political convergence happens, Next two issues are equally important is how much resources you are willing to commit and see what is the uh, domestic debate. Now that, leaves, that that lives aside one group. The second group is great power politics. And here are two examples, Iraq and uh, Ukraine. And great power politics, again, they are going to do what they are going to do. Uh, they, they don't care about institutions. They don't care about anything. And uh, what we saw in Iraq, uh, Ban uh, I, uh, I'm forgetting the name, Kofi Annan, sorry. Kofi Annan on the, on the eve said that uh, what uh, the United States is doing is illegal. It is beyond UN Charter. But United Nation, uh, United States has a Bush administration had a very clear line. You are with us, against us. And they don't actually pay heed to what the global public opinion is. They rather try to shape the public opinion. They try to gain public opinion. So in this sort of circumstances, the Security Council actually behaves like a debating society. And in the absence of an international court of law, uh, like the actual one which can decide legality of everything, the imprimatur of uh, as many countries as possible becomes uh, 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 the measurement of, of what is right and what is wrong. 
So uh, a lot of these votes, they all they do is to prove to the world that we are on the right side of the history. We are doing what is right because it is right. And then this actually plays uh, the role of, uh, of, as I said, a debating society of, uh, uh, you know, corralling, if I may use that word, global public opinion. Now, uh, here, uh, anyways, they are going to veto it. So what happened in the current crisis is, first, there was the United Nations Security Council resolution, which Russia effectively vetoed. Now, if you look at the procedures, again, you would be surprised to know 70 years uh, into existence and United Nations Security Council does not have a complete set of uh, working procedure. There's a provisional charter and it's still going on. So uh, uh, Shreyas was right in la laughing uh, when, when, he, when he was mentioning that uh, United Nations Security Council is tasked uh, with this uh, thing of maintaining global peace and security because if you, are, if you have this task of saving the planet, and you still don't have working rules. You are working on provisional rules. So, uh, anyways, uh, one of the uh, many convoluted rules is that if it is a procedural uh, vote, then the permanent file cannot actually veto it. So, first was an actual resolution which Russia vetoed, uh, India abstained. Second was a procedural vote that sought the opinion of United Nations General Assembly. Again, what I'm saying is they want to mobilize global public opinion. And if anything, uh, it, if you read so many uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, issues uh, over the last 70 years, one thing that has played some control over naked power aggression is global public revulsion. In 1991, first Gulf War, there was planning uh, of, uh, United States was planning uh, to use nuclear weapons and Colin Powell, then Secretary of Defense, he said, you don't let that genie lose because if you start today, you can't prevent others and say, don't do this. So global public revulsion, global public opinion has some constraining effect uh, even today on great powers. Some, I'm not saying they are not going to do anything, but some constraining effects, uh, uh, chapter after chapter in diplomatic history is proved. So uh, then there was this procedural vote, again, India abstains, it goes to the General Assembly, then it goes to General Assembly, again, India abstains there. Uh, there was another fourth vote uh, in UN Human Rights Council, that to India abstain. Now, uh, why uh, India abstains continuously? Uh, another five, seven minutes on that, and, and then we can open the floor for discussion. So A, there is a certain reciprocal uh, comfort, understanding, and a long history of supporting each other. So uh, Nehru, he did not like uh, uh, Soviet invasion uh, of Hungary, 1956, uh, but he did not condemn it. Uh, in fact, publicly he supported it. Indira Gandhi went to General Assembly uh, and extended her support uh, for uh, Soviet invasion in Afghanistan. Uh, now, before I move ahead, there is also one more thing that we need to keep in mind is that India has to worry about Security Council only during those years when it is an elected member. So this is the eighth time uh, I think we are serving as an elected member. And um, last time when we were there, the Syria uh, thing was a big thing. Now we are here, the Afghanistan and crime, uh, Afghanistan and Ukraine are big things. Uh, also, it started with Israel. So when we actually started, first we felt, uh, had to face uh, the, the Bamako or Mali coup thing, which is again uh, a, a very low stakes issue because yeah, it was not a great power politics game. Also, uh, these coups uh, keep happening four months before that. I think it was September, August, September. There was another coup in Bamako, Mali. So this, this keep happening all the time. So... And that was a low stake situation that India first faced uh, when it joined the Security Council in this term. Then there was this incessant uh, rocket launching by Hamas. That was another high stakes game. Uh, then after India faced Myanmar. Then after it came Afghanistan. Then after some relative uh, peace, again, uh, now it is uh, facing uh, the Ukraine situation in February of the second year that it's now. So uh, in some on some occasions, uh, we have to be worried and our opinion matters only if the issue goes to the General Assembly. 
but uh, in 1956 it went to general assembly in 1980 uh, it went to general assembly and i think 1980 indira gandhi did not visit personally but brajesh mishra who became uh, vajpayee ji's uh, national security advisor and also principal secretary in the pmo uh, he was a permanent representative uh, of india to the united nations and he delivered indira gandhi's uh, speech uh, in lieu of her if i'm not mistaken this is 1980 so that is uh, we, we supported it again uh, georgia 2008 we did not say a word <laughs> ukraine uh, uh, like the crimea crisis of 2014 it came to general assembly and shiv shankar menon uh, was the national security advisor there uh, he came out in open and said that look uh, 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 russia has legitimate security interest in crimea and therefore uh, uh, we chose to abstain or we did not uh, uh, we did not went against moscow and now Uh, what is happening most of you would have seen india's explainer uh, 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 in in very abstract terms on twitter or or you must have read it in the newspaper now the way we have consistently supported moscow moscow has consistently provided veto to us so uh, during the bangladesh crisis even before that uh, and uh, later on i think there are three or four occasions when russia has vetoed uh hostile resolutions for india so even when the united states which is now posing uh, up to us and we are posing up to them there is what we call strategic proximity if i if i were to use diplospic uh it it is a very recent phenomena before that united nations was swinging between india and pakistan so uh in a way there is a reciprocal support that is the first aspect of it second uh uh we genuinely understand uh and to an extent psychologically accept the sphere of influence uh, which is this whole issue about uh russia doesn't want uh, uh american missiles uh 50 miles 100 miles from its border and if you look at one of the most studied international disputes uh in in global history uh the cuban missile crisis it was also about that uh the soviet missiles they were in uh, uh Uh, uh 90 miles from florida flown into cuba uh, and there were jupiter uh, missiles targeting uh, uh, based in turkey targeting minsk and and all this uh, arrangement was there uh, and and uh, uh, they both agreed mutually that okay we are taking our missiles back you take your missiles back and we are not going to put nuclear arsenal against each other in your sphere of influence now sphere of influence is a slightly uh, complicated story which is not merely about placing missiles in each other sphere it is also about political control uh, uh, in each other sphere but i'm glad sripati uh, is here and he is able to join us uh, but india was not very happy with the maldives signing a status of force agreement directly with the united states now status of force is a military sort of an arrangement uh, where uh, a country uh, 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 can sign a status of force and give some impunity to the military troops there are some other uh, military concessions given uh it, it is not exactly a basing agreement but uh, it requires a lot uh, it, it ensures a lot of impunity so india if it is unwilling for power to directly deal with the united states within what it conceives as its own sphere of influence although we don't we have never spelled it out as clearly a doctrine we can basically understand uh, what is going on uh, with russia so the russian anxiety is something which we we are not entirely unsympathetic towards but whatever russia does uh, in in our voting uh, whenever it comes to and again here now we can expand the scope and look at all united nations agency voting happens not only in the security council where we are a member from time to time uh, but it also happens in the general assembly only if the matter comes from council to the assembly second uh, 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 there are also specialized agency international uh, atomic energy agency iaea where voting happens very frequently uh, and again it's an issue of friction between india and the united states uh, what to do with iran uh, what jay shankar once called uh, when he was uh, i think joint secretary of america he wrote a famous memo and he called iran one of the three problem children uh, so uh, uh, that that is an issue of friction opcw organization for prevention of chemical weapons there also voting happens 
uh, and I'll come to it in a moment. So there are there are a lot of the specialized agency where voting happens. Now we are even if India is sympathetic to Russia's vision or Russia's political challenges, uh, what we see is uh, that uh, uh, sometimes we disapprove of their methods. So in the Sergei Skripal case, uh, Russia lost uh, its OPCW vote, the famous OPCW vote, by 17 abstentions. And India was one of them which abstained. So even if India understands that uh, what this former uh, intelligence operatives can harm Russian political interests, so on and so forth. But when it comes to some of the uh, ghastly methods that are employed, uh, I think India draws a red line and says that, look, even if we understand your political interest, we are not going to give you a blank check. There is no carte blanche in politics. So what we'll do is we'll rather abstain. So then India becomes notoriously abstention. A, uh, it is a fence sitter. B, even when uh, uh, it has a sympathy towards Moscow, uh, it doesn't approve of its methods. So that is another reason where sometimes we are sympathetic, but uh, uh, simply we don't agree with the method. In year two, if you see deep down uh, uh, to what is going on in Ukraine, a lot of commentary that has come in, uh, came out from West, it is very sympathetic to Russian idea of uh, maintaining its own sphere of influence. But the method of appending an entire functional country and, and you know, making a mess out of it, this is something that the world disagrees with. There are diplomatic ways, there are methods, that are creative ways you can pursue and discuss and keep on nagging. But invading a country is a method that uh, people might not agree with. And, and that is the reason a lot of opprobrium is drawn towards Moscow and particularly President Putin. So that is another aspect. The third and a very important aspect uh, uh, is uh, our military dependence. And you would have heard it all the time in any explainer piece. Uh, you see, you will always hear this, that, oh, uh, India is a depend, India is hugely dependent, hugely dependent. But how intensively dependent? So everyone knows that India is dependent, but how intensively dependent? And let me quote, uh, a paper of my friend Samir, where he has uh, looked at the entire uh, military inventory of a Navy, Air Force uh, and, and Army. And his conclusion or, or the team that uh, came with Stimson Center data, 86% of our current inventory, 86% of our current inventory is either Russian or Soviet origin. So it brings a lot of challenges. Now, just to give you an example, uh, Army has a main battle tank. Uh, it also has artillery, uh, it has mechanized formations, so on and so forth. But the main battle tank, which is the main uh, or the key uh, ingredient of army's warfare, 96% of them, they are of Russian origin. And this dependence is not going away anytime soon because we uh, depend on Russia for the spares, the supplies. In some cases, uh, we also require the technical expertise. <coughs> Sorry. Now, just to let you know that this spare supply dependence, it all goes on for a day de for decades. It, it, it is not going on away anytime soon. So if you look at the 71 war uh, of Bangladesh, uh, six years before that, we had commissioned uh, the, uh, the British designed uh, uh, Vijayanta tanks and the Soviet designed T-55 tanks. So this two uh, formations uh, or these two uh, platforms were our main battle tanks in the 71 war. They stayed in service until 2008 and 2011 respectively. Only in 2008 and 11 we decommissioned them when we had adequate supply of T-72 and T-90 uh, were also under planning. Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, they stayed on a little longer uh, because the T-72 were not ready uh, or, or we were not having enough supply of them and they were gradually coming. But a usual lifetime uh, in some of the cases of these platforms is like 30, 40 years. So if we have acquired a platform that is, let's say, uh, about 10 years ago, we are going to depend on Russia for another 30 years until the lifetime of that. So uh, uh, considering this extensive self-life, our reliance is not going away anytime soon. Second, uh, 
we, we are talking a lot of diversification, but then there are transfer of technology issues. There are uh, issues regarding co-production. Uh, Russia is quite lenient. And despite that, we are diversifying. So a CIPRI report says that between 2006, uh, 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 16 and 20, uh, India's reliance on Russia dropped by 53% uh, compared to the earlier five-year period. So we are dramatically diversifying. And one platform which I research quite extensively is uh, artillery guns. Uh, and I think most of the artillery guns, uh, if you look at the field artillery rationalization plan of 1999, uh, I think 90% would be non-Russian uh, uh, made uh, artillery guns. Of course, there will be some French next guns, but the basic uh, uh, with the chases of uh, T-72 or T-90, but it would not be Russian origin. So all I'm trying to say is that uh, to use, uh, to not uh, bore you with details and, and, and just give a simple thing is Russian weapons are a drug for India for so many reasons. And India is trying hard to get away from it, but it is not simple. The issue is complicated. It is going to survive for very long. This is the military reason. But the fourth and very important is the strategic reason. We want Russia to remain neutral in uh, uh, in the China-India dispute. Uh, Russia is getting uh, closer and closer uh, to Beijing, particularly because of how uh, its relations with West are going south. And uh, th that is one of the reasons that China would use it to leverage. But it is very important that if not a mediating partner, at least Russia remains neutral in, in this situation. And finally, uh, this is something I tell my European friends is that look, even though our proximity with the United States is dramatically improving, this is not a Russia-United uh, States war. This is essentially a European war. And even if I go down, it is a Russia-Ukraine war. But let's even assume for a moment the way it is perceived, it's a, it's a, it's a European war and, and uh, Europe is the next target. Once the buffer state is taken away, Europe is the next target. Over the years, United States has created some equities with New Delhi. What has Europe done? When India's democratic institutions were, uh, were attacked, uh, the legislative assembly in Srinagar, uh, the, uh, the parliament uh, in, uh, in, in New Delhi, you produce anodyne statements. Now, if India produces an anodyne statement, uh, even if it includes its principal beliefs of territorial integrity, you should not be super surprised. Have you created any equities with India? Why do you want to, India to snap ties with Russia? A quarter of Pakistan's export was going to the European Union. When Pakistan, it uh, uh, literally attack the democratic institutions and democratic infrastructure, the symbol of democracy, the parliament. Did you say that we are going to stop importing for you? It would have crumbled Pakistan's economy, but you had interest in Afghanistan. So you did not create equities. Even when uh, this, this uh, entire uh, uh, Kashmir uh, episode happened, Article 370, uh, United States said it's an internal affair of India. It is the Indian side of Kashmir and whatever administrative arrangement they want, they can have it. In essence, they didn't use these exact words, but that was the pith of it. And how are you debating this in your parliament? So you can't expect unwavering support of India when you have created no equities. Of course, uh, the Pulwama attack is, is nothing compared to we lost 40 lives, but it is not nothing compared to the war that is going on in Ukraine. We may find it ghastly, uh, but for dastardly, but what happened uh, in parliament attack is compared, is, is nothing compared to the great war that is going on in Ukraine. An entire country is appended. So I'm, I'm not drawing false equivalences, but all I'm trying to say is if you create equities with a growing Indo Pacific partner, then uh, you would, you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, and cash uh, those equities when your time comes. And if anything, Europe has a message in it that now is the time 
with the growing stature of india in the indo pacific to start raising equities finally before the war started uh, uh, jay shankar was asked a question at munich conference that what will be india's role and it said that it would be a blend of beliefs and uh, interest so india's abstention on the one hand is is actually a reflection of it on the one hand we believe in territorial integrity sanctity of borders non use of force but also we are drawn by our own interest strategic military uh, and uh, uh, the need uh, for continuous veto and our past strong historical relationship with russia so that explains the role of united nation and india's abstention uh, thank you thank you thank you so much uh... Chirai for explaining so well uh, the way India has played its role, and I'm sure I've gone through your article, and you have further extended and explained where why India uh, you know, chose to sit on the fence throughout in the history and also in the current situation. So coming back to also the discussion on uh, uh, the role of UN. Uh, so uh, like. you mention about the charter and always china or russia uh, the countries also try to show charter having in their hand they always carry in their pocket whenever anything happens <laughs> even in the unsc meetings and they just bring it get out and show it so how do you see that does that charter plays the role of deterrence i never seen that charter is playing the role of deterrence any time for any country uh, in the past or then what is the role of you and it just a aid agency providing aid like world food program you mentioned in afghanistan or right now you an agency is playing a role in ukraine providing aid to the refugees uh, fleeing to neighboring uh, european countries or you an is a play the role of governing body in the conflict zone areas or it just oversight authority see uh, yes we need to understand this that to all of this you need basically resources and uh, un can do a lot of things but uh, again it requires resources it requires political mandate and uh, i have already explained in the cases where there is no political convergence un can't do anything where there is political convergence then also in many cases us a uh, un is not able to do it you would be surprised to know that i think it was last year or last to last year the united nations put out a tweet thanking those 23 countries those who paid their dues so out of 193 countries only 23 countries had paid their obligatory fees india was one of them so 170 countries are unwilling to pay to the united nations their member dues how do you run such a mammoth organization that is spread on all corners of the world so there is, there are a lot of things united nations can do but these are practical matters so sometimes when we expect a lot from united nations we also have to understand the resource constraint and the political constraint under which it operates okay great uh, so my next question i'll combine with what uh, shravan is saying also about the role of what un can play because uh, he asked uh, uh, in the absence of un uh the regional organizations will take over uh maybe in conflict situation or in other different situations also maybe climate change or disaster management and etc so here we are talking about the basic team internationalism versus the regionalism uh because particularly in the conflict zone uh now in the here we are talking about primary we are focusing on ukraine so nato is the primary uh and if tomorrow anything happens maybe uh, cspo will be there so, uh, so how do you see because uh, with the shanghai cooperation organization they are coming with the rat their own anti terrorism body in the central asia and for the sco uh, member country so different regional organization maybe those would be economic oriented or the security oriented organization so if this regional organization becoming more strong and strong so further the role of uh, un will dilute and it will no it will not have any role in the future and 
do you think like that and if that is so do you think there are tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 kind of regional organizations which will be uh, 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 handled by from above to the town maybe kind of thing what, what do you think uh, see shreyas uh, there are no uh, answers to this uh, a under certain circumstances conflict should be provide, uh, prevented and solution should be pre uh, provided it doesn't matter who is doing it so mm -hmm. of course we can write an academic paper on uh, internationalism versus pluralitarianism and so on and so forth and even those who are interested i think we have mentioned this point in passing i and professor harsh pant we have written a paper for orf uh, and and uh, there there we have mentioned this thing in passing that increasingly the gap that is left out by united nations Uh, would be filled in by the coalition of the willing now coalition of the willing is a phrase that has a very negative connotation because it was used in iraq war but today if four countries of the quad they are coming together and forming the coalition of the willing sure 122 countries were facing sun sign and they want to engage climate change and harness the potential of the sun and want to form the uh, coalition of willing for sun sign countries okay. the international solar alliance sure why not so it would increase in we cannot expect united nations to do everything under the resource constraints if others are taking the leadership if african union is playing a very different role now look at the african uh, uh, union uh, uh, nuclear weapons free zone uh, uh, treaty which is uh, uh, palindaba treaty now palindaba treaty uh, is not a un mediated treaty it is essentially uh, what was negotiated at the level of uh, uh, african union now uh, if if they want peace in the region they don't want nuclear weapons in the region they don't want anybody to be bullied and threatened by nuclear region they want to maintain the peace good for them let them do it it see the objective of united nations is not to maintain the supremacy of the united nation the whole objective is that peace and security should be maintained now it doesn't mean that regional organization if you put 10 people together they are always going to work in fact if 10 people are coming together so many soups sometimes spoil the soup look at what happened to asean and myanmar the rest of the nine were not able to find a common ground for the internal politics of asean itself which i don't want to spell out in detail but all i'm trying to say is that coming together and solving a problem is good if they want to do it we don't always want to preserve united nations as 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 the body through which all work should be done if united nation doesn't have a mandate or if united nation doesn't want to fulfill a role for whatever reasons maybe resource constraint maybe political will maybe uh, of non mandate then others can fill in the odd gap there is no issue with it but it also doesn't mean that if 10 people from the region would come together they are always going to solve look at sark what has sark achieved in terms of regionalism so we can create this artificial arguments we can also write papers we can do academic debate but the real picture is very complicated interesting uh, so uh, does it mean like since last 70 years like any uh, organization or authority evolves it try to fill the gaps whatever the gaps they have and it, you have studied the journey of you and also how it has evolved throughout uh, and uh, or uh, india is also always raising this issue about reforms in the un and particularly uh, western nations they always uh, give a statement like they also want to reform every country nobody says they don't want reform everybody says they want reform but how do you see this journey and how it is uh, 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 because particularly if you ask me i uh, i don't see any reforms are happening soon or maybe in the past also uh there, there were not credible reforms which could uh, impact or affect or maybe useful in this conflict like situation what is happening between russia and ukraine and do you if you want uh, it has to be uh, un has to be reformed and it has to be more influential what will be those reforms what do you, how do you uh, think how do you look at this issue <sighs> i think no country wants to bind itself to any charter any reform uh -huh. uh, like at best it serves as as some restraint some resistance to as i said naked aggression of power or display of power but 
I mean, uh, whatever reform you do, I have basically classified two kinds of situation. Mm. Even w- what was the problem with United Nations Charter in Rwanda? Tell me. It was not a reform issue. Nobody was willing to do anything because there were no political interests involved. Did the UN Charter, any particular clause of UN Charter, prevent you or prevent those countries who were in the Security Council to do more uh, and send uh, reinforcements and replenishments in Rwanda? Is the Charter at, at fault in Rwanda? I mean, I, I agree that that in certain situations you need reform to find solutions, and sometimes it is the nature of of the institutional design uh, which is preventing you from doing anything. But there are also cases where the design is not preventing you from doing anything, and you still don't do anything. So you have to keep in mind the variables that I uh, laid out earlier. And the variables are a whether there is political convergence oh. and interest to do something. If nobody is interested in doing anything, as in the case of Rwanda, then you you are simply simply you won't see action. If there is political co- convergence, uh, the next step is whether you are willing to commit resources. And third, what is the domestic debate for those powers those who are willing to commit resources? And again, these are the cases, these three variables are applicable in the cases where uh, 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 non-great uh, power involvement is there. So when great power involvement is there, it becomes a different story and, and no amount of reform is going to bind them. Like, did a veto stop Russia? There is institutional checks and balances in play, but did it act? Perhaps no. Uh, on the same line, uh, Mr. Sina is asking, uh, what is the status of India is uh, asking for permanent member at the UNSC? Uh, how do you see it uh, in the form of the organization? See, uh, the, the veto and permanent seat is a club good which the five do not share, want to share with anyone. Now, uh, there's a very interesting metaphor used by Kishore Mahbubani uh, uh, in one of these books. And uh, those who want to read uh, his article in full, it's like a 14, 20 page, nice article in this book, uh, United Nations Security Council. Very interesting book. There is a chapter by Kishore Mahbubani. Uh, and therein, uh, he says that look, if India ever wants to get into the uh, into the UN Security Council, one of the ways is it presents a Hobson's choice. Now, what is a Hobson's choice? Is uh, an impossible choice, and it says, look, I don't, I don't believe in your Security Council because your secure, no, Security Council uh, comprises of the victors of 1945, uh, and I don't believe in it. Either you include me, or I, I, I stop being a part of it. That extreme level of Hobson's choice. What the United States presented uh, to the Security Council in Iraq war. And this is like what you did to the Twin Towers on 9-11 is something that is unbelievable. You know, uh, I'm going to do it. Either you are with us or against us. Those kind of impossible choices, unless it doesn't go to that level, uh, uh, I, I, I don't see uh, any simple political solution to it. Uh, on the same line again, uh, Tanishk is asking the idea of strategic autonomy, particularly mm-hmm. in the UNSC and the way India voted again, uh, Pakistan abstained, India abstained, China abstained, remained abstained, the other countries voted. I know you have explained it very well how the voting happens in the UNSC, mm-hmm. uh, mostly by the Non, non-permanent members and the small island countries who get the membership once in a while. But uh, recently, Russia, uh, uh, as Tanish said, uh, that Russia came out with a list uh, uh, of the countries uh, and the individuals acting against the interest of Russia. Uh, so uh, here, there is a choice. And uh, 
you have written a very nice uh, research article that India and the US friends elsewhere pose at the US, uh, which explains a lot. Uh, we have shared the link also in the chat box. But uh, could you please uh, elaborate more about the choices we have? Uh, I, you, I know I know you have said about their political situation, their other obligations we are buying from Russia, but uh, how do you see, because there is a morality is involved now with the, the Ukraine, all the Western countries are uh, arguing about the morality and invading other countries, the idea of sovereignty. And it's a huge subject, I know that, but I just want to know your uh, uh, thought on idea of strategic autonomy and the UNSC. See, uh... Strategic autonomy, if you simplify it, is we are going to make choices based on our interests. And it is currently a flavor of the day. Uh, it is going to remain that way because we are entering in an interdependent world where the world has to benefit from India as much as India has to benefit from the world. And uh, I'm sorry to say I don't want to be disrespectful, uh, but I was recently talking to a Pakistani friend and they said that, look, we are also getting increasingly non-aligned and so on and so forth. And I said, look, you cannot emulate India's strategic autonomy until you have autonomy. Mm. If you are dependent on the IMF for the next tranche to run your country, then you can't be autonomous. The case of India is different. India is an economic bright spot uh, and I hope it uh, continues uh, to progress that way. You look at a small market like nuclear energy. Mm. When it is globally shrinking, India still remains a, a bright spot. And I've written separately about it that how the world market on nuclear uh, uh, energy is, is, is shrinking while India remains a bright spot. Uh, same goes for India's growing middle class. Uh, same grows for weapons. Globally, uh, when the appetite, uh, I mean, of course, the world is expanding this defense budget after what happened now. So up until now, the average was around, global average was around 6%. It will now short up around 8%. Even a country that was in slumber of arming itself, like Germany, it said, look, this is 100 billion euros. The world has changed. We now need to arm ourselves. And they also increased their defense budget, so on and so forth. So if you have in it, if, if you have the wherewithal, you can remain autonomous. Iraq war, everybody said, every Western country supported the United States, save for Germany. Germany said it is against our foreign policy values. We don't believe in this kind of military aggression and we are not going to support you. Huh. Germany was the only odd member out. And it also happened that during the Bush administration, a Bush administration switched its support for Germany's Security Council said uh, to Italy's position uh, where, it, where, uh, where it said that and Italy was essentially uh, 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 you know uh, in opposition to Germany and uh, uh, th there is this uh, uh, speech by Colin Powell he said that we'll remember who supported us and our support would be reciprocated so Germany paid that price the United States support became lukewarm Germany paid that price for its autonomy. So autonomy sometimes comes at a price. Uh, but still, who can remain autonomous? You need that metal in itself. You need that promise in itself. You need uh, your own, uh, you, you need to stand on your own feet. And I think India is becoming increasingly that economic giant who can exercise autonomy. So my short answer, strategic autonomy is here to stay. Uh, we are too big a country. To be fully encamped by A or B or C and in essence we are going to uh, make decisions that are in our interest as in India's interest. Thank you. I think that's the prerogative comes with the when you're a superpower and you can see you're either with us or against us the way we said and like in the past also other presidents say same thing in different language probably. And a similar question earlier asked by Sabhata Kera, I'm sure you answered that question in your current answer, I think. But uh, we have already showed the time, I think, with the two minutes. So I'll just have a last question, then why there is so much emphasis on the UN and UNSC in the media, particularly in the Ukraine. 
and why if if it doesn't as is the that the, 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 the you quoted the diplomat who said that it doesn't have any role as we discussed earlier if if that's so be then why so much import uh, emphasis see uh, shes uh, uh, i discussed this uh, two days ago uh, in in class with my students uh, and there are two reasons to it one in absence of any centralizing global authority uh, numbers become the moral approval for what you are doing so that is one of the reasons why you see this all hulabulu over uh, who is voting for home who is not voting for home so on and so forth second what we call is geopolitical codes so this voting are geopolitical codes in itself so when you abstain you are subscribing to a geopolitical code that we are neither with you nor with them and you are not only saying that we don't agree entirely with the united states but you are also sending a message to moscow that we are not going to give you a card blank so this is this votes are not merely votes of a debating society these are geopolitical codes and hence we all stress debate discuss and even today's session why why this is important because this uh, this is a barometer you can gauge the uh, geopolitical winds with this so uh, uh, this is one of the reason two of the reasons uh, why this votes are important and why we are discussing them yeah that makes uh, more sense moral approval and geopolitical code and i think that is the answer i'm sure there is not a definitive answer and we are not looking anything definitely comes from the un and not from today's session also because uh, but uh, we are looking to debate uh, putting forward to to the people and our audience also like what could be and what it will be uh, this international organization international body can become or what needs to be changed and what needs to be the expect from this international body i think uh, uh, it was a very interesting discussion and i was particularly looking forward So this discussion, as I said, told you earlier, and I gained, I learned a lot here uh, from your insights, and I'm sure our uh, audience also have learned from this. And I would personally thank you, uh, and also from the Asian Pathfinders for your time and insight. So I'll hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Shreyas, and I think you said it right. It was a very interesting discussion, and thank you, Chirai, for. uh sparing your time for this uh, discussion so uh and we look forward to seeing everyone next session so have a good weekend everyone meanwhile uh, uh we have shared chirai's publications links in our chat box if anybody wants to have more uh, insights they can go through the links thank you yes. perfect that's right thank you so much yes and have a good weekend everyone take care